All right, if you wouldn't mind, let's go ahead and open our Bibles up. Turn them on, swipe them, whatever you want to do. As I mentioned, my name is John Sherwood, and uh, we are jumping into a series that we started last week called Gospel Counterfeits. And uh, as was mentioned last week, we do like to... um, Participate and engage and not just spectate. Uh, I definitely don't want you guys coming here just to listen to me. I know that that would not be all that worth your time. So uh, we are going to continue. And I want to get a little feedback, a little bit of dialogue from you guys about last week for those of you that were here. You know, we talked about the need for sound doctrine and the dangers uh, that we can face with false teachers We discussed the need of being like the Bereans in Acts 17, having noble character, being willing to eagerly examine the scriptures every day, and not just to take someone's word for it, me included. And we also talked about how, you know, false teachers were infiltrating the church there in the New Testament, and that we've got to be on our guard all the more as we now have more access to more information through the internet and media and how false teachers have more doors and pathways into our hearts and our minds and our lives. And today, we're going to discuss the topic of grace. We're going to discuss, in particular, how grace can get perverted. It's kind of a strange word combination, right? We don't often think of grace being perverted, but we will see in the New New Testament that It happened then, and it still happens today, and we're going to talk a little bit about specific ways in our context that I think the gospel of grace gets perverted. But first, I want you to write down something, okay? So go ahead and grab a notebook or your phone. I definitely encourage you to take notes. Uh, It's definitely part of the heart of being a Berean, is to be able to go back and verify, to examine the scriptures. Uh, You know, obviously, you can go back and listen to this and watch it as well, but it's really great if you can take your own notes and ask your own questions in one sentence, How would you define grace to someone? In one sentence, how would you define grace to someone? What is grace? I'll give you just a moment to jot that down. And then I'm going to invite you guys, either online or in person, to share how you would define grace with someone. Is there anyone online that would like to share with us? how you would define grace for someone? Go ahead and raise your digital hand. How about in person? How would you define grace? Yes, sir. Nice and loud. Undeserving favor. favor. All right. What else? Yes, sir. Receiving everything but deserving nothing. Okay. What else? How would you define grace? Yes. Unwarranted, unearned forgiveness and acceptance. Unwarranted, unearned forgiveness, forgiveness, acceptance, acceptance and love. The people online can't hear you unless I repeat it, so I'm having to make sure I catch what you say. Yes. Yes. One party taking the initiative to to fill the need completely of the other person, okay? What else? Anybody online? Yes, sir. Being looked at as blameless. Is that what you said? Okay. All right. How about some? Go ahead. Have them jump in. A gift we don't deserve. Okay. Raise your hand if you have a hard time understanding or embracing or believing grace. Okay. I saw a couple hands shoot up as fast as possible. (laughs) Okay. A few more maybe sheepish ones, you know. Who has a hard time just understanding what grace is? I know I, I do sometimes. Let me ask, why do you think we have such a hard time understanding grace? Yes. It's not tangible, okay? It doesn't make sense, someone said. Yes. 
I'm not gracious. <laughs> oh, that ouch. Okay, that's very true. I mean, for me, like we all feel that, right? Uh, yes, sir. We don't experience it all the time, okay? Um, go ahead and put your comments in the chat there, and James, you can uh, read them out for us. Yes, sir. Uh, the world is not gracious, okay? Why do we have a hard time understanding grace? We don't see it very much. Uh, it's the opposite of how the world works. Okay, it's the opposite of how the world works, okay? What else? Yes. Okay, he said sometimes we're concerned about justice and fairness and grace doesn't seem like a fair thing, okay? So it is kind of counter to maybe some things that we desire or hold value to. James, anybody on the line have a comment? Yeah, we have a couple of comments, yeah. Uh, it's not common in the world, Lonnie and Kelsey said. Tim Pullen said we live in a society built on works. Kathy said it's hard to accept something we don't deserve. Uh, Kelly said... Ha! <laughs> all right, for all you Trekkies out there. All right, so a couple of book recommendations. Um, a good friend of mine, Sam Lang, wrote a book called The Guilty Soul's Guide to Grace. I believe it was Sam, actually. Um, but you could probably find that somewhere. It's a great place to begin. If you're looking for something a bit more uh, dense and academic, I would highly recommend this book called Paul and the Power of Grace by John Barclay. This is actually the newer truncated version. This is like the dummied down version of his 700-page tome. But uh, this is really good stuff, and I think um, I'm going to obviously borrow from him a little bit today some of these concepts, because I think grace is hard for us to understand, just like you guys mentioned. And it's hard for us because we don't understand it, because we don't experience it, we don't tend to believe it or live it or, or share it with other people, right? Um, so let's start today in our topic of grace and the gospel counterfeits. Let's start in perhaps one of the most common, well-known passages in all the Bible, John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 16. Does anybody know that one by heart? Would anybody like to stand up and recite it? Go ahead. Yep. For God so loved the world... That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but inherit eternal life. This is one of the first Bible passages I ever memorized as a very, very young child in a fairly non-religious environment. But my very religious grandfather taught that to me. And I had very little understanding of what it meant. But I memorized it. And I would imagine that most of us are probably familiar with this passage. Some of us probably can quote it. But what have we been taught that this verse means? Again, more dialogue, more interaction, please. How have you been taught to understand what this means? If you were to share with someone who'd never heard this passage before and you read it to them and you said, this is what it means, what would you say? Or if someone did that with you, what did they say? Okay, believe and be saved, right? What else? Okay, it doesn't matter what you did, okay? God is going to accept you. Yes. What else? Yes, ma'am. That's right. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So that it, there's this scope to it, right? God loved the world. Jesus died for the world, for every human. <clears throat> that can kind of scrape against our cultural, individualistic menti mentality sometimes. would have been probably quite different culturally for the audience originally for John. What else? You know, this is one of the most well-known verses because it's a beautiful passage. Verse uh, 16 here, in some ways, unfortunately, is often plucked out. And taught to little children, such as myself, by itself. And it's in a larger context here of the chapter of John. And the book of John 
which lies in a larger context of the canon of Scripture, right? And we've got to be careful, obviously, not to pluck uh, verses out of their context too quickly because it can distort their meaning. And I want to propose, I'm not here to step on anyone's toes or offend anyone unnecessarily, but I want to propose that the ways that we have often been taught and teach this passage could be subtly misleading. That God loves the world and Jesus died for you and you must believe in him. And if you believe in him, you will have eternal life. That is true. But the way that we take that idea and we take it to mean to believe in him as some sort of like mental assent, like I agree intellectually that he died with me, therefore I'm going to live forever, is a bit too shallow and misleading to the point where it actually could become false. And I believe that this is a gospel counterfeit. If you take a closer look, actually, in the few verses right after this, Jesus says something about, you know, coming into the light, men hating, dark, or hating the light because of their deeds being dark. You know, he starts to connect belief in verse 16 with our lifestyle and our choices and our behavior. So there's a holistic picture here that if you pluck verse 16 out and take our modern concept of belief, it can kind of get a bit misleading. So... Let's look over in Ephesians chapter 2, another very famous passage about the topic of grace. And I'm going to try to set up what I believe to be a gospel counterfeit, although unintendedly, okay, I will grant that I think all of us maybe skew and misrepresent the gospel unintendedly, right? This is not to condemn anyone's motives or intentionalities, but simply to draw our minds clearer to what the Bible actually teaches. Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, as Aaron just spoke about. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This passage, especially verses 8 and 9, much like John 3.16, are true. These passages are true. But it's a part of a larger context, a part of the chapter, a part of the letter itself, a part of the canon in which it is a part of. It's very true that our works do not and cannot ever save us. This is the entire message of Jesus, that he came to fulfill the law of righteousness that we could never fulfill. No human other than Jesus could ever fulfill the righteous standards of a holy perfect deity and therefore be accepted by this perfect holy deity because we are not perfect but Jesus fulfills that perfection our salvation our forgiveness is never earned by our works ever and anything contrary to this is a gospel counterfeit the new testament authors would have called them heretics it would be heresy, it is heresy, to say that our works somehow activate salvation. And this is what Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is saying. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, let's talk for a minute in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm establishing... Grace, as the status quo that most of us are probably familiar with, using some passages we might be familiar with, now I'm going to hopefully create a little tension for us. Everybody loves tension. <laughs> Everyone loves tension. Um, sort of. Verse 18. This is a passage we might not be as familiar with. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins... <clears throat> 
a person commits, guess what? They're outside the body. But whoever sins sexually, they sin against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? He's obviously speaking to the Christians in Corinth. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Paul reminds the Christians here in this letter that they were purchased. They were bought at a price. God's grace to them was not free. You know, it's an often common expression in Christianese circles. God's grace is free. Yeah, no, kind of, that's misleading. It was actually unbelievably expensive. God's grace for us was bought with the blood and death of his perfect son. Now God's grace is freely offered to all, but it didn't cost God nothing. It was expensive. And he says, because it's so expensive, because grace is not cheap, honor God with your body. He says that grace, much like Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15, which we will come to later in another one of these lessons in this series, he says grace should cause us to do something. Grace is not free. It's costly. And that cost should cause us to honor God with our bodies. Now, look over in Luke chapter 14. Further tension. The terminology that's often used for this gospel counterfeit is called cheap grace. It's a terminology that refers to grace that has been cheapened, meaning that it demands nothing of the recipient. God's grace is free. You could never do anything to earn it, which is true. Therefore, just believe John 3.16, mentally assent somehow or agree, and you're good. God accepts you. God forgives you. There is more tension than that in the scriptures. And I believe that when we think of, believe, and represent the gospel that way to other people, we, we, we subtly falsify it. We make it a counterfeit. Now again, for some of us, this could be abrasive. This could be very counter to maybe what we have always believed and been taught. I know just like I was when I was a little boy and I was taught John 3.16. I was taught, although inadvertently, and I believed cheap grace. I believed well into my 20s. That I was a Christian. I believed in Jesus. Sure, he died for my sins. Why not? And I lived however I wanted. And I did not honor God with my body. And I lived sexually immoral lifestyles. I was addicted to drugs, hurting people, in and out of jail, doing whatever I wanted with my life, honoring only me. Believing that Jesus died for my sins and therefore I had eternal life. Because I'd never been taught the other side of the coin. Which is what creates tension here for us. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Large crowds, they're traveling with Jesus. And turning to these guys, he says. I always call this my organic chemistry teaching of Jesus. This is a weed out class in case you were wondering. (laughs) If anyone comes to me and does not hate father or mother, wife or children, brothers or sister. Yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. The first time I read this, I was like, what did he just say? That's crazy. I thought I just had to believe that Jesus died for my sins and I'd have eternal life. What's this all about, Jesus? This this sounds kind of crazy. Hate your father and mother, your children? I didn't have children the first time I read this. I do now. I would venture to say it's more intense now. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? 
For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and estimate whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. I love that. If you recognize that you're about to lose a war because you do not have the firepower, while the other is still a long way off, you're going to be like, hey, hey, can we, can we work this out? I should take note of this when I'm in an argument with my wife, huh? <laughs> Sorry, honey. While you are still a long way off, honey, can we, can we work this out? In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. John tells us which is true in chapter 3, verse 16. If we believe in Jesus, we have eternal life. Jesus says that in order to follow him into the kingdom of God, it's going to cost us something. In fact, he says it's going to cost us everything. And he says the costs are so high, you better sit down and estimate it. You know, I was never taught that stuff when I was taught about grace. I don't know how much a five-year-old could understand such concept, concepts. But I know that when I was in my early 20s and I was first really introduced to these kinds of teachings of Jesus, there was great tension in my mind. And I thought, that cheap grace thing sounded kind of better. <laughs> I liked being able to have Jesus as my genie get out of hell helper without him demanding anything of me. And then I learned he, demand, he demands not just some things, but everything. And you know, for me personally, there was some kind of truth that rang with that. I thought if eternal life is really true, like if I'm really going to be able to live forever perfectly, it makes sense that it would demand everything of me. And so when I read these words of Jesus, I thought, he's not playing, but it kind of makes more sense now. And then I had a decision to make. Do I really believe? Or do I just want to cheap grace belief, which is no belief at all? It's a gospel counterfeit. So let's explain something and clarify something here as we get ready to close out. Jude chapter 1. Jude is one of the last little tiny letters in the New Testament. If you flip all the way to the back right before Revelation, that letter that you probably don't like reading very much. We'll go to Jude. And if you'd like to jump into Revelation, check out the series from the end of last year called the Apocalypse. Jude chapter 1. Verse 4. We'll just read this brief verse. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. There's those false teachers again we talked about last week. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Jude says that grace gets perverted. And I would imagine that often it's done unintentionally in our context. For Jude, it was being done intentionally, presumably. But how, what does he say perverts the gospel? For their context, what was perverting the gospel was that people were denying Jesus as the sovereign Caesar king and lord of the universe and saying that God's grace is so abundant, so amazing, that you can live whatever immoral life you want. He says it's a perversion. But how does the gospel of Jesus Christ get perverted for us in our context today? You know, oftentimes 
at least for me in my experience, and I think this is probably representative for many of us, we've been taught and believe things like God's grace and God's love is unconditional. It's not. God's grace is not unconditional. It is unconditioned. God's grace is not conditioned by your works. But God's grace does come with conditions. Does the differentiation make sense? It could be subtle, but it's the whole ballgame. It's the difference between a biblical gospel and a gospel counterfeit. We can never condition God's grace to come to us. It is unconditioned. He offers it even though we could never do anything to earn it. However, when he offers it, if we are to accept it, it comes with conditions. What's the condition? That it would demand all of us. That we would embrace his grace, his love, his forgiveness, eternal life. And in return, we would align ourselves pledge our allegiance to him and him alone, and that we would allow him to have sovereign rule in our life. He gets to say, he gets to say, it's a costly condition. And unfortunately for many of us in America, we have been conditioned, no pun intended, to believe that the gospel is unconditional, God's love is unconditional, that I can have God's grace and it demands nothing of me. It's a lie and it's a perversion. And it's not what the scriptures teach. Now there might be a more fundamental question underlying all this for us, and that is, do we believe the scriptures as the final authority? That's a different lesson for a different time. But if the scriptures are going to define what the true gospel is, then we've got some problems with what we've been taught the gospel is. I think for so many of us, the gospel can subtly get perverted Because we think not only can we not do anything to earn it, which is true, but then we also in conjunction think that it demands nothing of us. And that's very untrue. God's grace is conditioned by our response to it. Otherwise, there's no judgment. If God's grace was unconditional, then everyone would be saved no matter what. And that's clearly not what Jesus in the New Testament teaches. A biblical gospel has tension. And for us who embrace and believe this biblical gospel, it's tough. It's tough to navigate this tension, especially over time. We tend to fall on one side or the other, sometimes depending on the day where we tend to fall more on that cheap grace side and we think, well, God's going to forgive me, doesn't matter. Or we tend to fall on the legalism and work side where we tend to think, as Aaron shared, well, I don't know, I've got to do some good works so that God's grace will forgive me. There's a tension right down the middle, right? And it's tough to stay there. And we identified many of the reasons why it's so hard. Because we don't experience this kind of thing in any other sphere of life. Nothing is like God's grace. It is beautiful and challenging all at the same time. So as we seek to be authentic disciples of Jesus, and as we seek to share this biblical gospel and not gospel counterfeits, let's make sure that we're not perverting the gospel of God's grace, by believing or teaching others that it's conditioned by our works or that it's unconditional and doesn't demand our full allegiance, our obedience, and our entire lives. Let's pray together.